story and tell the host the motivations, the stories of the struggle in between. You're about to understand the history of Cat Lejeune, North Carolina. The correct pronunciation of the word Lejeune is truly pronounced Lejeune, and that's because Lieutenant General John Archer Lejeune is the one who um, really made the Marine Corps base what it is today. He was our 13th commandant, um, a combat leader, a visionary, an educator, a thinker, a man of great charisma, professionalism, all of that. So P.T. Britt, who is a businessman, um, born and raised in Chicago, now living in Hawaii, is bringing great awareness um, to the new Marines um, that is coming into the Marine Corps of how to pronounce his name. And again, it's pronounced for John. What I want you to do is sit back and enjoy this show. Hi, my name is Gloria Taylor, the host of Motivations, the stories of the struggle in between. Wow, I'm here with um, Mr. Patrick Brent. I want to welcome you to Motivations, Mr. Brent. Aloha, Gloria. Aloha, Aloha. to you. And such a blessing to be here. Um, Motivations is to be part of a big day here with you. I want you yes. to um, tell the nation who is Patrick Brent. Well, I've, I've done most of my uh, journalistic type work under the name P.T. Brent. Initials I kind of got as a nickname when I was in the, in the Marine Corps. I'm a businessman from Honolulu, Hawaii, raised in the inner city of Chicago, got lucky in the hotel business now in Hawaii. I, uh, like many, many people, there's an old chestnut, once a Marine, always a Marine. Well, um, I'm pretty guilty of all that. I, uh, once I got uh, started going back into some of my journalistic pursuits, I ended up trying to be embedded with Marines and spent as much time as I could. I have a young man I was with since he's two weeks old. He's a, he's a lieutenant colonel in infantry now in San Francisco. We call him Tommy. And um, for a lot of reasons, I made him my best friends. I guess I should say, I should just say that um, I've been with a lot of groups. I've been, I have a rather blessed uh, bio, and I've been with some corporations, and I've uh, been with some pretty exclusive things, like I played polo for a while, of all the groups. Marines are absolutely the best. I, yes, they are. Ted Williams once said, the best team he ever played on was the U.S. Marines. Yeah. And that's me. And that is really in your heart. I can really see the passion right. um, that you have for that. Um, Mr. Brick, I, and I, I, this is wonderful because I, I've just seen you do a lot of things um, through some of the YouTube footage that I was able to look at. But the main reason why you're here today, um, here we're on the um, Kepler June base here at the Ball Center, where you're going to be having a special lunch here today. So kind of tell okay. everyone about what you're going to be doing here later today. Well, we're here, we're here, and we've been, I've made a few uh, trips of this nature to honor Lieutenant General John Archer Lejeune. And let me just say right now, Gloria, yes. John Archer Lejeune, that's incontrovertibly incontrovertibly the correct pronunciation of the general's name and his family. Wow. The last generation, it's kind of got a little, it's, it's slid a little, mm -hmm. in fact, quite a bit. The family likes, says when they hear it, they're watching TV down in Louisiana, they say, we well, cringe every time we hear the June word. Yes. They wouldn't even say it, the June I've word. always said the June. You know, I, because you're here. raised, right? Yeah. Sure, sure. And, uh, but when I went in the Marine Corps, they always said Lejeune. My father, my stepfather adopted me as a career Marine. All the, the senior guys at the Marine Corps League, which he founded, uh, they all say it was your. It's just that um, modern times and the way it's spelled, mm -hmm. I don't know why it slipped. Certainly the word colonel did not slip. And there's, there's an invisible iron colonel. Mm -hmm. Might have stolen that from General Lejeune. <laughs> General Lejeune is a, a very special man here. Um, a lot of great things I can see for the military. Um, this kind of elaborate a little bit more on some of the things that he started. Sure. General Lejeune is arguably mm -hmm. the greatest leatherneck of all time. Mm -hmm. That was many editorials written under that epitaph. Mm -hmm. General Lejeune, um, without him, I don't know where the Corps would be. It might not even be here. At the end of World War I, Let's go back. General Lejeune was born in Louisiana. His family came from Switzerland, not France. Mm -hmm. And in the process of coming here, much like the Italian word, you've heard the word etymology for studying origin and the, um, the origin and the use of a word. Mm -hmm. Well, the word colonel, 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 
Colin all started in Italy. By the time it went through France and that area, it, up, it got an R, like many words. But actually, the journey's in really pure French. It's really, the family went to Canada, Illinois, and ended up with the plantation. They went to the plantation down in uh, Juan Coupe Parish, Louisiana. In the process of doing that, there were a genteel and chivalrous family. They, uh, between the Creole and the Acadian, and the whole uh, way of having access there for the last couple hundred years, their name has always been Lejeune. The general used that name as his daughter and aides and many, it's all well documented. Virtually over 200 descendants, way over 200 years in America. They all say Lejeune. Somehow or another, it, um, some or another, it lapsed. The general was, um, and you know, there's a lot of things like that, like uh, the word colonel or the word, we don't say corpse. Uh, there's a host of many Americans say, when they go up to D.C., they say, War Washington, where do they get that R? But I think it's a lot of, but this is not frivolous. John Arch Lejeune deserves respect. Had he not been around, had he not been around, the entire history of the Marine Corps would have been completely different. John Archer went to the Naval Academy, graduated in 1888, he was second in his class academically. The Navy wanted to put uh, then midshipman Lejeune into the Naval Corps of Engineering because he was so intelligent and that was where they wanted to put their best guys like they did for So then, so then we, uh, what happened is um, he didn't like that. He had fallen in love with the Marines. He wrote the governor and the senators while he's at sea and finally the Navy relented and said, if you can, the Marine Corps will ask for you, we'll let you go to the Marine Corps. So instead of being sworn in on that ship, I think it was the USS Cincinnati, he was sworn in. Yeah, instead of being sworn as an ensign in the Navy, he was sworn as a second lieutenant in the Marine Corps. And little More did he or change history. Mm -hmm. He uh, went ahead for a long career in the Mexican War, mm -hmm. many skirmishes. The Marine Corps did a lot of small actions in those days. They were on ships a lot. Then eventually, he was he was a one-star general, and he um, he was a one-star general. Uh, and he went to Washington. They were going to make him the next commandant of the Marine Corps. But he turned it down because in 1917, the winds of war were going on for World War I. It was imminent. So he went to uh, he went to France. He got command of the Marine Brigade. And General Pershing also made him the first Marine to be in charge of an Army division, an entire Army division. And then he did a lot to make that war work. He went behind the lines. By that time, he's two stars. He went behind the lines to check out the topography. Behind the lines. He... Uh, he divided his forces in one of the major battles that ended World War I on Armistice Day. He also stood up many things that hadn't been done before. He was the first Marine to go to the end of the child line. Many Marine Corps traditions and, uh, that we accept today mm -hmm. are all founded with General Lejeune. I just want to thank you, um, Mr. Burton. I'd like to see the passion you have um, to motivate the people to understand who this man um, really was. And, and I want to thank you for being here but I want you to stay tuned because we'll be right back with more of Patrick or I'd say P.T. Brent. Okay. So stay tuned. Welcome back to Motivation. So stories of the struggle in between. I'm here with P.T. Brent, uh, Patrick Brent. Welcome back to Motivations. So glad to have you here. Um, I just want to say, um, I'm looking at your hands there, and they're so beautiful beads. Kind of tell me um, why do you yeah, have I'm not sure they're beads? beautiful. I'm not sure they're too expensive either. No, they, they're they, not. Uh, well, you know, it's funny you talk about motivations because yes. uh, I have to tell you, the Lejeune family and the trip to Louisiana motivated, motivated the... Uh, the heck out of me. I um, I went down there to make a quick check because I didn't want to be, I wanted to make sure this thing was right. And um, in the process of doing it, I did a draft of the story. The family down there was so grateful that they made me one of the five judges in the Mardi Gras parade. Now I want you to imagine this. 
this is really kind of a sybaritic, wild scene. Mm -hmm. Some of the women on these floats are rather, you know, rather attractive, right. to say the least. So to get off the floats, they have absolutely no, they don't mind bribing, so to get off the floats, and they gave me all these jewelries and even presents and things like that. Mm -hmm. And I, I thought I was kind of being bribed, but, it, but I, um, so I'm going to give them back to you, and next time you go to Louisiana, you can return them to those, those, those wild women for me. Okay, I would do that. Okay. I'm, I'm so glad to have you here. Like you said, this is motivations from the stories of the struggle in between. And, and you know what, uh, Mr. Brent, I know that everybody has to go through something to get to where they are now. You're very um, successful, but you, you're motivating. You, you, you know, you've done the journalism, you've written stories, and to encourage other people, you're going on the, the journal legacy, and that inspires me. So I want to um, tell your story of the struggle, because I know this didn't happen overnight. Not at all. So kind of let the nation know what it took for you to get here today, Listen, I was I was based in Camp Geiger, a subset of Camp Lejeune, a long, long time ago, and I wasn't coming back here. And I, I was in Hawaii, and all of a sudden I uh, started doing these things because uh, my nephew came back from rescuing the Marine, came back from rescuing about 8,000 Americans, and one of the French ladies was challenging his pronunciation of the name, and I'd done it all, and, I, and so I was uh, so I kind of took umbrage with that and pursued it. I called George Barrels down here, he's the Commandant of the Marine Corps League, and uh, he had always said Lejeune, and he knew people at boot camp, they trained it, and he told me all his, we call them sea stories in the Marine Corps. Yes. You, know, you, know, you know how a sea story has to start? This is what I heard from George. A sea story starts, this really happened. Because <laughs> some people don't believe him. But anyway, so, uh, I, so I came down here, and, uh, and the people here are really great. They're just like Lejeune's family, which are gentle, chivalrous, lovely people. The family, um, family, as I say, motivated me. Now, becoming who you are, what are some of the things that you had to encounter um, as, as a struggle to sit here today? Well, first I had to get through kindergarten, and I had a sister, Teresa, and she was kind of tough, you know, the nuns. I was, uh, I have 17 plus years of Catholic schooling. I've been um, probably corrected and disciplined and whacked around by every uh, religious order the church has. That's okay. That's okay. And, and if I hadn't been there, I'd probably be in the brig. <laughs> That's a good thing. Um, and again, I'd like to thank you for being here on Motivations and talking about the legacy of what you okay. And that's what we're here today. We want everyone to understand um, what this man stood for, the things that he did to make the Marine Corps possible. Um, it is the history of the Marine Corps. And Mr. Britt is doing an excellent job of making sure that the Marines that are coming in now understand um, why they're in the Marine Corps. Because really, look for him, um, Patrick, it would not, like you said earlier, it may not have been a Marine Corps. So, you know, I'm just grateful for what you're doing with that. So I'm going to ask you too, um, in your journalism career, I know that you've written a lot of stories, mm -hmm. um, over 157 stories. So um, kind of tell us some of the things that you had to encounter as a journalist. Well, you know, I gave a lecture on journalism uh, last fall at Notre Dame. Wow. And uh, but I've never had a class on it. It's just that um, the process of um, going through school and becoming basically a very ambitious businessman tired of being poor, uh, pursuing, not so much pursuing money, but pursuing a lack of poverty. I, uh, I always like the idea of passing the word, especially like uh, the past year. Everybody likes to put their philosophy out there, and then when they do it in, in written form, they can't even fire back. And so uh, so I started uh, writing company newsletters, and uh, a couple of, I did a, something called Polo Gazette for eight years, and I, I was a investor in a digital publishing firm. In the process of doing this, what I call mediocre journalism, I, uh, my buddies were all going off to war uh, for in 2000, and they went off into the Kuwait War, uh, the Gulf War, and then uh, and I sat at home. Then they went off again in 2000, they got ready to go off in 2003 to uh, go catch Saddam. And uh, one of a really good buddy of mine named John Bates, Colonel John Bates, probably the finest Marine I've ever known. He said, you know, they're doing they're betting a lot of reporters. He said, you got that digital thing at the publishing firm. He says, why don't you go? So I cast all my business things aside. I flew to Kuwait. Uh, didn't have any credentials. One has to be careful one's, for one, one's wish, wishes because six, seven weeks later, I had a lot of credentials and had a lot of experiences and I did stories for um, three Honolulu newspapers. Got picked up by United Press as a reporter, UPI. And of course, I did some stuff for a magazine called Leatherneck. Yes, I see that. 
which I'm sure you have a lot of copies of it. Yeah, I'm going to tell them about Leatherneck. Leatherneck is the National Music uh, Magazine of the Marine Corps. It's part of the Marine Corps Association, which was founded in, in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba mm -hmm. by General Wright. I must say the name right, Majon. You got it, Cole. Okay. Great. Wow, okay. you just said a lot of great things here. I want you guys to stay tuned for more motivations from PT Brent. Welcome back to Motivations. My name is Gloria Taylor. I'm here again with PT Brent. And um, we're just going to um, let everyone know that, you know, he's done a lot of great things, but he's also have come out, we're coming out with two new books. And one of them is called Sea Stories, and the other is the American Geisha. Geisha, the American Geisha. They're due to come out in 2010. And I kind of want you to kind of elaborate on that a little bit, to get, tell everyone where they can get it. Um, they do come out okay. and all that good stuff. Well, they'll be on Amazon and the normal places, but um, the first book is largely uh, biographical. It's a collection of 29 sea stories yes. about my experiences in sports and military and some adventures I've had. Like once, I, one chapter is when I was I totaled an airplane mm -hmm. and uh, I kind of mess up a lot of stuff. So this time was a good chance that this is kind of a confessional. Only okay. Catholics like to do that. Now the other book, which I hope will um, will get far more notice, the other book is called The American Geisha, and the theory that in my travels in the Far East, I kind of fell in love with the classy Asian women, particularly the Japanese. They treat men so well. I'm not sure that's fair, but what's, what's the problem? So in, in observing this, I, I, I'm, sure I'm well traveled. I saw German women treat their men and so forth. Um, and American uh, men are probably the worst treated gender group on the planet. American men suffer a great deal of disrespect and mistreatment by their women. And I want to change that by making this somewhat of a tutorial for it. Um, American Geisha is uh, the theory that uh, American women and men should learn to, uh, to follow the way things in the old days were American. That doesn't mean American women are professional. I have a daughter. American women, women should be in the Senate, they should be in the Congress, they should, they should be in many, many positions. But when they come home, they should be, they should be very much, very loving, submissive, and, and uh, thoughtful of their husbands. Yes. Not, not do this male bashing thing. Uh, it's just wrong. It also assumes the man is a responsible person. You know, like Cary Grant in the movies, he pays his bills, he's responsible, he's not some, some slob that expects a woman to be a Victoria's Secret model. Mm -hmm. If both parties are doing their job, Romance is better, and the relationship's better. Yes, it is. It's actually, following this book should represent more dividends for the woman than the man. Mm -hmm. And she's motivating her man to be a better person, a better lover, and everything else. And uh, I suspect there'll be somewhere between a handful and 25 million women that probably take umbrage with this, because that's fashionable. Yes. But we're going to get the message across, mm -hmm. and we're going to get American men and women back on target. That's awesome. I want to thank you for being here, Motivations. It's thank been you. a pleasure. Okay. And I'm looking for more great things um, coming from you. You're just such an awesome guy. We'll see you at Mardi Gras. businesses belong to uh, our organization and we do a lot of uh, support that. put on a number of award programs MCIE's breakfast the uh, American Hero Awards Big Dog Weekend programs like that uh, to support the military and of course uh, we're happy uh, to be supporting this program I'm working on a project called the Lejeune Legacy 
And what Mr. Brent is going to talk to you about is like the first step, getting the correct pronunciation of General John Archer Lejeune's name. I'm really happy to see members from the both the print media, TV media coming out today, and of course the support from the PAO office. We really, we really appreciate that. Mr. P.T. Brent, who's an entrepreneur and uh, Hawaii hotel owner, writer, publisher, uh, does a lot of things with Marines and the sailors here, so we really appreciate him being here. Mr. Kim Kimball, who is the historian uh, for the Museum of the Marine, and he will follow up and give you a little bit of more in-depth of, uh, of what we're doing. And I'm particularly happy to see um, uh, General Bill Ayers retired from South Carolina National Guard and uh, retired Colonel from Marine Corps, who's the president of the Museum of the Marine. Happy to have you here today, Bill. And uh, of course, uh, all the uh, board members from the Museum of the Marine. We did a, a TV interview with them this morning with uh, uh, Motivations. Uh, it's a cable TV person. Happy to have her. Without further ado, I want to get this on the road, Mr. P.T. Frank. Strong supporter of the report. Come on up here. Great. Topic? John Archer Lejeune. John Archer Lejeune. That great is incontrovertibly, incontrovertibly, the way the name is pronounced in the spectrum. Family of John Archer Lejeune down in Louisiana. And was tasked me about last spring of uh, 2008 to try to get them back on balance. They're genteel, shepherds, and They deserve respect for this kind of great thing. Part of that, I wanted to make sure I was right. I did my quite a bit of homework on it. But I also went down there and part of that thing when I did the first draft of the story. They said uh, they invited me one of five judges in the Mardi Gras parade. And so um, women were getting off the floats. They're kind of uh, kind of outrageous now. They were getting off the floats. Where is that? They were getting off the floats and they were giving all this jewelry. When you get back to Mardi Gras, you can you get back to Mardi Gras, you can return that boat to <laughs> Senators, he did everything he could to make sure 
was it going to the other side? And then why did they said, because right where I asked for you, what you talking about? Gave a second to anybody here realize, just realize what it was like. It was an instant, instant sure. He uh, went on with his ring career. He was uh, born in Mexico. Supposed to be a rapid fire PMA. He, uh, he gets to um, gets to back to Washington for a one two. For a one is eminent. He's one star. The offer the chance to become a He passes on it. He goes over to France. He rides there one star. Before you know it, he's two stars in the army. General Pershing gives him the first command, the first marine command of the whole army division. How's our marine brigade? He, uh, set, he set a record. Went behind enemy lines as two star to check the topography out. He divided his forces for some of the battles that ended up concluding World War I. He also was the first Marine officer to ever go to make a pattern, always go in the rear of the chopper. So, so he, uh, he came home. Marines were heroes. So was he. However, the Army Chief of Staff, we had one there, you are. We started, instead of just being civilian guys, we started doing a lot of Army stuff. They were upset and disconcerted. So the uh, Army Chief of Staff made a vow to dissolve the Marine Corps, take the good guys the money he thought worthy to the Army. He worked at that for a long time. General adjourned, then he came back and became the 13th Commandant. Three tours as Commandant. What he spent much of his time doing? Walking the passageways of Congress, making sure we still have a Marine Corps. It was nip and tuck and he Give all historians credit for saving the United States Marine Corps. But he let it go there. But he became, became the best PAO the Corps ever had. He created the birthday message, the birthday ball. He created an uh, evening parade, the sunset parade, all not for the sake of uh, the enjoyment they all bring, but for the sake of saving our Corps. He did all those things to save the Corps. He didn't let it go there. He created the schools at Quantico. He was the first and third resident at a big house in the Quantico was CG there. He created the Marine Corps schools. He created amphibious uh, vessels, amphibious warfare. He, when he was in Cuba, he created the Marine Corps League, Marine Corps Institute later on. And, and uh, let's see, Marine Corps League the Marine Corps Institute. Of course, he did MCA, but for that, like you said, all these things we take for granted. He did MC Leisure. There was no fleet Marine Corps. All those battles in the Pacific, Sergeant Major, all those battles in the Pacific have been Army battles. Think about that flying race. So you know what I think about. The, uh, when I was, uh, all these honors, all these honors he had, there's a hall named after him at uh, Camp Azure, of course. There's a hall named for him at the, at the uh, Naval, uh, U.S. Naval Academy. There's a hall named for him at Quantico. And I recently was chatting with somebody at BMI. There's a hall, new hall named after there. In fact, the colonel at BMI in charge of history was with there a long time. And in her rainy days, a lady named Eugenia, who was her the last daughter, was on campus just like the Polar family is in that area. She came on campus. And she uh, said it was really kind of sad. She came on campus when people put mention her name. She said, Brian Costello, one of the many family members, over 200 sentenced down in Louisiana, so 17 books on Louisiana history. One is called the House of Lejeune. So Mr. Brett, every time, every time you watch television, you hear the said, um, the uh, five, oh yeah, I'm going to cover this one, five Marines. Last couple of years, he was joined the Marine Corps with a surname Lejeune from Louisiana. Four went to Paris Island, one went to Quantico. We're all still in. That was supposed to be Sergeant Lejeune now. We've been in since I interviewed him on the telephone. Four arrived at Paris Island, one at Quantico. They had one thing in common. All the sergeants said, and I like it, when it used to be years ago, they said, we don't say that name that way anymore. We don't say that. What was even fear? Afraid of getting struck. Third time he tried to get his name set right. His name was Lebo. 
moments he would have probably been respected. But no, somewhere along the line, we're going to change the general's name. So, second lieutenant, the majority tells me it's going much better right now. The, um, the family's from Switzerland. The, um, I, I learned that, and many other things about the methodology of the name and the pronunciation from the doctor, Tom Link, who's a professor and chair of Italian and French language down at Wayne University. Dr. Link, her dissertation at Long Dupay, Perry, Louisiana. Thank you. 